Chapter Twenty Three of the Purple Land. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rick Vina. The Purple Land by W. H. Hudson. Chapter Twenty Three. She then led me to the kitchen at the end of the house. It was one of those roomy, old fashioned kitchens still to be found in a few estancia houses built in colonial times, in which the fireplace, raised a foot or two above the floor, extends the whole width of the room. It was large and dimly lighted the walls and rafters black with a century's smoke and abundantly festooned with sooty cobwebs but a large cheerful fire blazed on the hearth while before it stood a tall gaunt woman engaged in cooking the supper and serving mate this was ramona an old servant on the estancia there also sat my friend of the tangled tresses which he had evidently succeeded in combing well out for they now hung down quite smooth on his back and as long as a woman's hair another person was also seated near the fire whose age might have been anything from twenty-five to forty-five for he had i think a mixture of indian blood in his veins and one of those smooth, dry, dark faces that change but little with age. He was an undersized, wiry-looking man, with a small, intensely black moustache, but no whiskers or beard. He seemed to be a person of some consequence in the house, and when my conductress introduced him to me as Don Hilario, he rose to his feet, and received me with a profound bow. In spite of his excessive politeness, I conceived a feeling of distrust towards him from the moment I saw him, and this was because his small, watchful eyes were perpetually glancing at my face in a furtive manner, only to glance swiftly away again whenever I looked at him, for he seemed quite incapable of meeting the gaze of another. We drank mate and talked a little, but were not a lively party. Doña Demetria, though she sat with us, scarcely contributed a word to the conversation, while the long-haired man, Santos by name, and the only peon on the establishment, smoked his cigarette and sipped his mate in absolute silence bony old ramona at length dished up the supper and carried it out of the kitchen we followed to the large living-room where i had been before and gathered round a small table for these people though apparently poverty-stricken ate their meals after the manner of civilized beings at the head of the table sat the fierce old white-haired man, staring at us out of his sunken eyes as we entered. Half rising from his seat, he mentioned to me to take a chair near him. Then, addressing Don Hilario, who sat opposite, he said, This is my son, Calixto, just returned from the wars, where, as you know, he has greatly distinguished himself. Don Hilario rose and bowed gravely. Demetria took the other end of the table, while Santos and Ramona occupied the two remaining seats. I was greatly relieved to find that the old man's mood had changed. There were no more wild outbursts like the one I had witnessed earlier in the evening. Only occasionally, he would fix his strange, burning eyes on me, 
in a way that made me exceedingly uncomfortable. We began the meal with broth, which we finished in silence, and while we ate, Don Hilario's swift glances incessantly flew from face to face. Demetria, pale and evidently ill at ease, keeping her eyes cast down all the time. Is there no wine this evening, Ramona? asked the old man in querulous tones when the old woman rose to remove the broth basins. The master has not ordered me to put any on the table, she replied with asperity and strongly emphasizing the obnoxious word. What does this mean, Don Hilario? said the old man, turning to his neighbor. My son has just returned, after a long absence. Are we to have no wine for an occasion like this? Don Hilario, with a faint smile on his lips, drew a key from his pocket and passed it silently to Ramona. She rose, muttering, from the table and proceeded to unlock a cupboard from which she took a bottle of wine. Then, going round the table, she poured out half a tumblerful for each person, excepting herself and Santos, who, to judge from his stolid countenance, did not expect any. No, no, said old Peralta, give Santos wine, and pour yourself out a glass also, Ramona. You have both been good, faithful friends to me and have nursed Calixto in his infancy. It is right that you should drink his health and rejoice with us at his return. She obeyed with alacrity, and old Santos's wooden face almost relaxed into a grin when he received his share of the purple fluid, I can scarcely call it juice, which maketh glad the heart of man. Presently, old Peralta raised his glass and fixed his fierce, insane eyes on me. Calixto, my son, we will drink your health, he said, and may the curse of the Almighty fall on our enemies. May their bodies lie where they fall till the hawks have consumed their flesh and their bones have been trodden into dust by the cattle and may their souls be tormented with everlasting fire. Silently, they all raised their glasses to their lips, but when they set them down again, the points of Don Hilario's black moustache were raised as if by a smile, while Santos smacked his lips in token of enjoyment. After this ghastly toast, Nothing more was spoken by any one at the table. In oppressive silence, we consumed the roast and boiled meat set before us, for I dared not hazard even the most commonplace remark, for fear of rousing my volcanic host into a mad eruption. When we had finished eating, Demetria rose and brought her father a cigarette. It was the signal that supper was over, and immediately afterwards she left the room, followed by the two servants. Don Hilario politely offered me a cigarette and lit one for himself. For some minutes we smoked in silence, until the old man gradually dropped asleep in his chair, after which we rose and went back to the kitchen. Even that sombre retreat now seemed cheerful after the silence and gloom of the dining-room. Presently, Don Hilario got up, and with many apologies for leaving me, explaining that he had been invited to assist at a dance at a neighboring estancia, took himself off. Soon afterwards, though it was only about nine o'clock, I was shown to a room where a bed had been prepared for me. It was a large, musty-smelling apartment, almost empty, there being only my bed 
and a few tall upright chairs bound with leather and black with age the floor was tiled and the ceiling was covered with a dusty canopy of cobwebs on which flourished a numerous colony of long-legged house spiders i had no disposition to sleep at that early hour and even envied don hilario away enjoying himself with the rocha beauties my door looking out to the front was standing wide open the full moon had just risen and was filling the night with its mystic splendour putting out my candle for the house was now all dark and silent i softly went out for a stroll under a clump of trees not far off i found an old rustic bench and sat down on it for the place was all such a tangled wilderness of great weeds that walking was scarcely practicable and very unpleasant the old half-ruined house in the midst of the dusky desolation began to assume in the moonlight a singularly weird and ghost-like appearance near me on one side was an irregular row of poplar trees and the long dark lines cast from them by the moon fell across a wide open space where the rank growing thorn apples predominated in the spaces between the broad bands made by the poplar tree shadows the foliage appeared of a dim hoary blue starred over with the white blossoms of this night flowering weed about these flowers several big gray moths were hovering suddenly appearing out of the black shadows and when looked for noiselessly vanishing again in their mysterious ghost-like manner not a sound disturbed the silence except the faint melancholy trill of one small night-singing cicada from somewhere near a faint aerial voice that seemed to be wandering lost in infinite space rising and floating away in its loneliness while earth listened hushed into preternatural stillness presently a large owl came noiselessly flying by and perching on the topmost boughs of a neighbouring tree began hooting a succession of monotonous notes sounding like the baying of a bloodhound at a vast distance another owl by and by responded from some far-off quarter and the dreary duet was kept up for half an hour whenever one bird ceased his solemn boo 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 i found myself with stilled breath straining my sense to catch the answering notes fearing to stir lest i should lose them a phosphorescent gleam swept by close to my face making me start at its sudden appearance then passed away trailing a line of faint light over the dusky weeds the passing firefly served to remind me that i was not smoking and the thought then occurred to me that a cigar might possibly have the effect of relieving me from the strange indefinable feeling of depression that had come over me i put my hand into my pocket and drew out a cigar and bit the end off but when about to strike a vesta on my matchbox i shuddered and dropped my hand the very thought of striking a loud exploding match was unendurable to me so strangely nervous did i feel or possibly it was a superstitious mood i had fallen into it seemed to me at that moment that i had somehow drifted into a region of mystery peopled only by unearthly fantastic beings the people i had supped with did not seem like creatures of flesh and blood 
the small, dark countenance of Don Hilario, with its shifty glances and Mephistophelian smile, Demetria's pale, sorrowful face, and the sunken, insane eyes of her old, white-haired father, were all about me in the moonlight and amongst the tangled greenery. I dared not move. I scarcely breathed. The very weeds, with their pale, dusky leaves, were like things that had a ghostly life, and while I was in this morbid condition of mind, with that irrational fear momentarily increasing on me, I saw at a distance of about thirty yards a dark object which seemed to move, fluttering in an uncertain way towards me. I gazed intently on it, but it was motionless now, and appeared like a black, formless shadow within the shade of the trees. Presently it came again towards me, and passing into the clear moonlight revealed a human figure. It flitted across the bright space, and was lost in the shade of other trees, but it still approached, a waving, fluttering figure, advancing and receding, but always coming nearer. My blood turned cold in my veins. I could feel my hair standing up on my head, until, unable to endure the terrible suspense longer, I jumped up from my seat. A loud exclamation of terror came from the figure, and then I saw that it was Demetria. I stammered out an apology for frightening her by jumping up, and finding that I had recognized her, she advanced to me. Ah, you are not asleep, signor, said she quietly. I saw you from my window come out here more than an hour ago. Finding you did not return, I began to grow anxious, and thought that, tired with your journey, you had fallen asleep out here. I came to wake you, and to warn you that it is very dangerous to lie sleeping with your face exposed to the full moon. I explained that I had felt restless, and disinclined to sleep, regretted that I had caused her anxiety, and thanked her for her thoughtful kindness. Instead of leaving me then, she sat quietly down on the bench. Signor, she said, if it is your intention to continue your journey tomorrow, let me advise you not to do so. You can safely remain here for a few days for in this sad house we have no visitors. I told her that acting on Santa Coloma's advice, given to me before the fight, I was going on to the Lomas de Rocha to see a person named Florentino Blanco in that place, who would probably be able to procure me a passport from Montevideo. How fortunate it is that you have told me this, she replied. Every stranger now entering the Lomas is rigorously examined, and you could not possibly escape arrest if you went there. Remain with us, signor. It is a poor house, but we are well disposed towards you. Tomorrow Santos shall go with a letter from you to Don Florentino who is always ready to serve us, and he will do what you wish without seeking you. I thanked her warmly, and accepted the offer of a refuge in her house. Somewhat to my surprise, she still remained seated on the bench. Presently she said, It is natural, senor, that you should not be glad to remain in a house so triste but there will be no repetition of all you are obliged to endure on first entering it. Whenever my father sees a young man, a stranger to him, he receives him as he received you today, mistaking him for his son. 
after the first day however he loses all interest in the new face becoming indifferent and forgetting all he has said or imagined this information relieved me and i remarked that i supposed the loss of his son had been the cause of his malady you are right let me tell you how it happened she replied for this estancia must seem to you a place unlike all others in the world and it is only natural that a stranger should wish to know the reason of its sad condition i know that i can speak without fear of these things to one who is a friend to santa Coloma. and to you i hope senorita i said thank you senor all my life has been spent here when i was a child my brother went into the army then my mother died and i was left here alone for the siege of montevideo had begun and i could not go there at length my father received a terrible wound in action and was brought here to die as we thought for months he lay on his bed his life trembling in the balance our enemies triumphed at last the siege was over the blanco leaders dead or driven into exile my father had been one of the bravest officers in the blanco forces and could not hope to escape the general persecution they only waited for his recovery to arrest him and convey him to the capital where doubtless he would have been shot while he lay in this precarious condition every wrong and indignity was heaped upon us our horses were seized by the commander of the department our cattle slaughtered or driven off and sold while our house was searched for arms and visited every week by an officer who came to report on my father's health one reason for this animosity was that calixto my brother had escaped and maintained a guerrilla war against the government on the brazilian frontier at length my father recovered so far from his wounds as to be able to creep out for an hour every day leaning on someone for support then two armed men were sent to keep guard here to prevent his escape we were thus living in continual dread when one day an officer came and produced a written order from the commandante he did not read it to me but said it was an order for every person in the rocha department to display a red flag on his house in token of rejoicing at a victory won by the government troops i told him that we did not wish to disobey the commandante's orders but had no red flag in the house to hang up he answered that he had brought one for that purpose with him he unrolled it and fastened it to a pole then climbing to the roof of the house he raised and made it fast there not satisfied with these insults he ordered me to wake my father who was sleeping so that he also might see the flag over his house my father came out leaning on my shoulder and when he had cast up his eyes and seen the red flag he turned and cursed the officer go back he cried to the dog your master and tell him that colonel peralta is still a blanco in spite of your dishonorable flag tell that insolent slave of brazil that when i was disabled i passed my sword on to my son calixto who knows how to use it fighting for his country's independence the officer who had mounted his horse by this time laughed and tossing the order from the commandancia at our feet bowed derisively and galloped away my father picked up the paper 
and read these words let there be displayed on every house in this department a red flag in token of joy at the happy tidings of a victory won by the government troops in which that recreant son of the republic the infamous assassin and traitor calixto peralta was slain alas senor loving his son above all things hoping so much from him and enfeebled by long suffering my poor father could not resist this last blow from that cruel moment he was deprived of reason and to that calamity we owe it that he was not put to death and that our enemies ceased to persecute us demetria shed some tears when telling me this tragical story poor woman she had said little or nothing about herself yet how great and enduring must have been her grief i was deeply moved and taking her hand told her how deeply her sad story had pained me then she rose and bade me good night with a sad smile sad but the first smile that had visited her grief clouded countenance since i had seen her i could well imagine that even the sympathy of a stranger must have seemed sweet to her in that dreary isolation after she left me i lit my cigar the night had lost its ghostly character and my fantastic superstitions had vanished i was back once more in the world of men and women and could only think of the inhumanity of man to man and of the infinite pain silently endured by many hearts in that purple land the only mystery still unsolved in that ruinous estancia was don hilario who locked up the wine and was called master with bitter irony by ramona and who had thought it necessary to apologize to me for depriving me of his precious company that evening end of chapter twenty three chapter twenty four of the purple land this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rick Vina The Purple Land by W. H. Hudson Chapter 24 I spent several days with the Peraltas at their desolate, kindless cattle farm, which was known in the country round simply as estancia or campos de peralta such wearisome days they proved to me and so anxious was i getting about paquita away in montevideo that i was more than once on the point of giving up waiting for the passport which don florentino had promised to get for me and boldly venture forth without even that fig leaf into the open Demetria's prudent counsels, however, prevailed, so that my departure was put off from day to day. The only pleasure I experienced in the house arose from the belief I entertained that my visit had made an agreeable break in the sad, monotonous life of my gentle hostess. Her tragical story had stirred my heart to a very deep pity and as I grew every day to know her better, I began to appreciate and esteem her for her own pure, gentle, self-sacrificing character. Notwithstanding the dreary seclusion in which she had lived, seeing no society, and with only those old servants, so primitive in their ways for company, there was not the slightest trace of rusticity 
in her manner. That, however, is not saying much, for Demetria, since in most ladies, most women, I might almost say, of Spanish origin, there is a natural grace and dignity of manner one only expects to find in women socially well placed in our own country. When we were all together at meals, or in the kitchen sipping mate, she was invariably silent, always with that shadow of some concealed anxiety on her face. But when alone with me, or when only old Santos and Ramona were present, the cloud would be gone, her eyes would lighten up, and the rare smile come more frequently to her lips. Then, at times, she would become almost animated in conversation, listening with lively interest to all I told her about the great world of which she was so ignorant, and laughing, too, at her own ignorance of things known to every town-bred child. When these pleasant conversations took place in the kitchen, the two old servants would sit, gazing at the face of their mistress, apparently absorbed in admiration. They evidently regarded her as the most perfect being that had ever been created, and though there was a ludicrous side to their simple idolatry, I ceased to wonder at it when I began to know her better. They reminded me of two faithful dogs always watching a beloved master's face and showing in their eyes, glad or pathetic, how they sympathize with all his moods. As for old Colonel Peralta, he did nothing to make me uneasy. After the first day, he never talked to me, scarcely even noticing my presence, except to salute me in a ceremonious manner when we met at table. He would spend his day between his easy chair in the house and a rustic bench under the trees, where he would sit for hours at a time, leaning forward on his stick, his preternaturally brilliant eyes watching everything, seemingly with a keen, intelligent interest. But he would not speak. He was waiting for his son, thinking his fierce thoughts to himself, like a bird blown far out over a tumultuous sea and wandering lost, his spirit was ranging over that wild and troubled past, that half a century of fierce passions and bloody warfare in which he had acted a conspicuous part. And perhaps it was sometimes even more in the future than the past, that glorious future when Calixto, lying far off in some mountain pass or on some swampy plain with the trailing creepers covering his bones, should come back victorious from the wars. My conversations with Demetria were not frequent, and before long they ceased altogether. For Don Hilario, who was not in harmony with us, was always there, polite, subdued, watchful, but not a man that one could take into his heart. The more I saw of him, the less I liked him, and though I am not prejudiced about snakes, as the reader already knows, believing as I do that ancient tradition has made us very unjust towards these interesting children of our universal mother. I can think of no epithet except snaky to describe this man. Wherever I happened to be about the place, he had a way of coming upon me, stealing through the weeds on his belly, as it were, then suddenly appearing unawares before me, while something in his manner suggested a subtle, cold-blooded, venomous nature. Those swift glances of his which perpetually came and went with such bewildering rapidity, reminded me not of the immovable, stony gaze of the serpent's lidless eyes, but of the flickering little forked tongue that flickers, flickers, vanishes, and flickers again, 
and is never for one moment at rest. Who was this man, and what did he there? Why was he, though manifestly not loved by anyone, absolute master of the estancia? He never asked me a question about myself, for it was not in his nature to ask questions, but he had evidently formed some disagreeable suspicions about me that made him look on me as a possible enemy. After I had been a few days in the house, he ceased going out, and wherever I went he was always ready to accompany me, or when I met Demetria and began conversing with her, there he would be to take part in our conversation. At length the piece of paper so long waited for came from the Lomas de Rocha, and with that sacred document testifying that I was a subject of Her Britannic Majesty, Queen Victoria, all fears and hesitation were dismissed from my mind, and I prepared to depart for Montevideo. The instant Don Hilario heard that I was about to leave the Estancia, his manner toward me changed. He became, in a moment, excessively friendly, pressing me to prolong my visit, also to accept a horse from him as a gift, and saying many kind things about the agreeable moments he had spent in my company. He completely reversed the old saying about welcome the coming, speed the parting guest, but I knew very well that he was anxious enough to see the last of me. After supper, on the eve of my departure, he saddled his horse and rode off to attend a dance or gathering of some kind at a neighboring estancia, for now that he had recovered from his suspicions, he was very eager to resume the social pleasures my presence had interfered with. I went out to smoke a cigar amongst the trees, it being a very lovely autumnal evening, with the light of an unclouded new moon to temper the darkness. I was walking up and down in a narrow path amongst the weeds, thinking of my approaching meeting with Paquita, when old Santos came out to me and mysteriously informed me that Doña Demetria wished to see me. He led me through the large room where we always had our meals, then through a narrow, dimly lighted passage into another room I had not entered before. Though the rest of the house was now in darkness, the old colonel, having already retired to bed, it was very light here, there being about half a dozen candles placed about the room. In the center of the floor, with her old face beaming with delighted admiration, stood Ramona, gazing on another person seated on the sofa. And on this individual I also gazed silently for some time, for though I recognized Demetria in her, she was so changed that astonishment prevented me from speaking. The rusty grub had come forth as a splendid green and gold butterfly. She had on a grass-green silk dress, made in a fashion I had never seen before, extremely high in the waist, puffed out on the shoulders, and with enormous bell-shaped sleeves reaching to the elbows, the whole garment being plentifully trimmed with very fine cream-coloured lace. Her long, thick hair, which had hitherto always been worn in heavy plaits on her back, was now piled up in great coils on her head, and surmounted by a tortoise-shell comb, a foot high at least, and about fifteen inches broad at the top, looking like an immense crest on her head. In her ears were curious gold filigree pendants reaching to her bare shoulders. She also wore a necklet of half doubloons linked together in a chain, and heavy gold bracelets on her arms. It was extremely quaint, possibly 
this finery had belonged to her grandmother a hundred years ago, and I dare say that bright green was not the proper tint for Demetria's pallid complexion. Still, I must confess, at the risk of being set down as a barbarian in matters of taste, that it gave me a shock of pleasure to see her. She saw that I was very much surprised, and a blush of confusion overspread her face. Then, recovering her usual, quiet, self-possessed manner, she invited me to sit on the sofa by her. I took her hand and complimented her on her appearance. She laughed a little shy laugh, then said that, as I was going to leave her next day, she did not wish me to remember her only as a woman in rusty black. I replied that I would always remember her, not for the color and fashion of her garments, but for her great unmerited misfortunes, her virtuous heart, and for the kindness she had shown to me. My words evidently pleased her, and while we sat together conversing pleasantly, before us were Ramona and Santos, one standing, the other seated, both feasting their eyes on their mistress in her brilliant attire. Their delight was quite open and childlike, and gave an additional zest to the pleasure I felt. Demetria seemed pleased to think she looked well, and was more light-hearted than I had seen her before. That antique finery, which would have been laughable on another woman, somehow or other, seemed appropriate to her, possibly because of the strange simplicity and ignorance of the world displayed in her conversation, and that gentle dignity of manner natural to her would have prevented her from appearing ridiculous in any costume. At length, after we had partaken of mate, served by Ramona, the old servants retired from the room, not without many longing, lingering glances at their metamorphosed mistress. Then, somehow or other, our conversation began to languish, Demetria becoming constrained in manner, while that anxious shadow I had grown so familiar with came again like a cloud over her face. Thinking that it was time to leave her, I rose to go, and thanked her for the pleasant evening I had spent, and expressed a wish that her future would be brighter than her past had been. Thank you, Richard, she returned, her eyes cast down, and allowing her hand to rest in mine. But must you leave me so soon? There is so much I wish to say to you. I will gladly remain and hear it, I said, sitting down again by her side. My past has been very sad, as you say, Richard, but you do not know all. And here she put her handkerchief to her eyes. There were, I noticed, several beautiful rings on her fingers, and the handkerchief she held to her eyes was a dainty little embroidered thing with a lace border, for everything in her makeup was complete and in keeping that evening. Even the quaint little shoes she wore were embroidered with silver thread and had large rosettes on them. After removing the handkerchief from her face, she continued silent and with eyes cast down, looking very pale and troubled. Demetria, I said, tell me how I can serve you. I cannot guess the nature of the trouble you speak of, but if it is one I can help you out of, speak to me without reserve. Perhaps you can help me, Richard. It was of this matter I wished to speak this evening, but now how can I speak of it? Not to one who is your friend, Demetria? I wish you could think that the spirit of your lost brother, Calixto, was here in me, for I am as ready to help you as he would have been, 
and I know, Demetria, that you were very dear to him. Her face flushed, and for a moment her eyes met mine. Then, casting them down again, she replied sadly, It is impossible. I can say no more to you now. My heart oppresses me so that my lips refuse to speak. Tomorrow, perhaps. Tomorrow morning I leave you, and there will be no opportunity of speaking, I said. Don Hilario will be here watching you, and though he is so much in the house, I cannot believe that you trust him. She started at the name of Don Hilario, and cried a little in silence. Then, suddenly, she rose and gave me her hand to bid good night. You shall know everything tomorrow, Richard, she said. Then you will know how much I trust you and how little I trust him. I cannot speak myself, but I can trust Santos, who knows everything, and he shall tell you all. There was a sad, wistful look in her eyes when we parted that haunted me for hours afterward. Coming into the kitchen, I disturbed Ramona and Santos, deep in a whispered consultation. They started up, looking somewhat confused. Then, when I had lit a cigar and turned to go out, they got up and went back to their mistress. While I smoked, I pondered over the strange evening I had passed, wondering very much what Demetria's secret trouble could be. The mystery of the green butterfly, I called it, but it was really all too sad, even for a mental joke, though a little timely laughter is often the best weapon to meet trouble with, sometimes having an effect like that of a gay sunshade suddenly opened in the face of an angry bull. Unable to solve the riddle, I retired to my room to sleep my last sleep under Peralta's dreary roof. End of chapter 24「Chapter 25 of the Purple Land This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rick Vina The Purple Land by W. H. Hudson Chapter 25 About eight o'clock next morning, I bade the Peraltas goodbye and set out on my long-delayed journey, still mounted on that dishonestly acquired steed that had served me so well, for I had declined the good Hilario's offer of a horse. Though all my toils, wanderings, and many services to the cause of liberty, or whatever people fight for in the Banda, had not earned me one copper coin, it was some comfort to think that Candelaria's never-to-be-forgotten generosity had saved me from being penniless. I was, in fact, returning to Paquita, well-dressed, on a splendid horse, and with dollars enough in my pocket to take us comfortably out of the country. Santos rode out with me, ostensibly to put me on the right road to Montevideo. Only I knew, of course, that he was the bearer of an important communication from Demetria. When we had ridden about half a league without any approach to the subject on his part, in spite of sundry hints I threw out, I asked him plainly if he had a message for me. After pondering over the question for as long a time as would be necessary, to work out a rather difficult mathematical problem, he answered that he had. Then, said I, let me hear it. He grinned. Do you think, 
he said, that it is a thing to be spoken in half a dozen words. I have not come all this distance merely to say that the moon came in dry, or that yesterday, being Friday, Doña Demetria tasted no meat. It is a long story, senor. How many leagues long? Do you intend it to last all the way to Montevideo? The longer it is, the sooner you ought to begin it. There are things easy to say, and there are other things not so easy, returned Santos. But as to saying anything on horseback, who could do that? Why not? The question, said he, have you not observed that when liquor is drawn from a cask, wine or bitter orange juice to make orangeade or even rum, which is by nature white and clear, that it runs thick when the cask is shaken? It is the same with us, senor. Our brain is the cask out of which we draw all the things we say. And the spigot? That is so, he struck in, pleased with my ready intelligence. The mouth is the spigot. I should have thought the nose more like the spigot, I replied. No, he gravely returned. You can make a loud noise with the nose when you snore or blow it in a handkerchief, but it has no door of communication with the brain. The things that are in the brain flow out by the mouth. Very well, said I, getting impatient. Call the mouth spigot, bunghole, or what you like, and the nose merely an ornament on the cask. The thing is this. Doña Demetria has entrusted you with some liquor to pass on to me. Now pass it, thick or clear. Not thick, he answered stubbornly. Very well, clear then, I shouted. To give it to you clear, I must give it off, and not on my horse, sitting still, and not moving. Anxious to have it over without more beating about the bush, I reined up my horse, jumped off, and sat down on the grass without another word. He followed my example, and after seating himself in a comfortable position, deliberately drew out his tobacco pouch and began making a cigarette. I could not quarrel with him for this further delay, for without the soothing, stimulating cigarette, an Oriental finds it difficult to collect his thoughts. Leaving him to carry out his instructions in his own laborious fashion, I vented my irritation on the grass plucking it up by handfuls. Why do you do that? he asked with a grin. Pluck grass, what a question. When a person sits down on the grass, what is the first thing he does? Makes a cigarette, he returned. In my country, he begins plucking up the grass, I said. In the Banda Oriental, we leave the grass for the cattle to eat, said he. I at once gave up pulling the grass, for it evidently distracted his mind, and lighting a cigarette, began smoking as placidly as I could. At length he began, There is not in all the Banda Oriental a worse person to express things than myself. You are speaking the truth, I said. But what is to be done, he continued, staring straight before him and giving as little heed to my interruption as a hunter riding at a stiff fence would pay to remark about the weather when a man cannot get a knife he breaks in two an old pair of sheep shears and with one of the blades makes himself an implement which has to serve him for a knife this is how it is with doña demetria she has no one but her poor Santos to speak for her. 
if she had asked me to expose my life in her service that i could easily have done but to speak for her to a man who can read the almanac and knows the names of all the stars in the sky that kills me senor and who knows this better than my mistress who has been intimate with me from her infancy when i often carried her in my arms i can only say this senor when i speak remember my poverty and that my mistress has no instrument except my poor tongue to convey her wishes words has she told me to say to you but my devil of a memory has lost them all what am i to do in this case if i wished to buy my neighbor's horse and went to him and said sell me your horse neighbor for i have fallen in love with it and my heart is sick with desire so that i must have it at any price would that not be madness senor yet i must be like that imprudent person i come to you for something and all her expressions which were like rare flowers culled from a garden have been lost by the way therefore i can only say this thing which my mistress desires putting it in my own brute words which are like wild flowers i have myself gathered on the plain that have neither fragrance nor beauty to recommend them this quaint exordium did not advance matters much but it had the effect of rousing my attention and convincing me that the message entrusted to santos was one of very grave import he had finished his first cigarette and now began slowly making himself a second one but i waited patiently for him to speak my irritation had quite vanished those wild flowers of his were not without beauty and his love and devotion for his unhappy mistress made them smell very sweet presently he resumed Signor, you have told my mistress that you are a poor man that you look upon this country life as a free and happy one that above all things you would like to possess an estancia where you could breed cattle and race horses and hunt ostriches all this she has revolved in her mind and because it is in her power to offer you the things you desire does she now ask you to aid her in her trouble and now senor let me tell you this the piralta property extends all the way to the rocha waters five leagues of land and there is none better in this department it was formerly well stocked there were thousands of cattle and mares for my master's party then ruled in the country the colorados were shut up in montevideo and that cutthroat frutos rivera never came into this part of the cattle only a remnant remains but the land is a fortune for any man and when my old master dies doña demetria inherits all even now it is hers since her father has lost his calabash as you have seen now let me tell you what happened many years ago don hilario was at first a peon a poor boy the colonel befriended when he grew up he was made capatas then mayordomo don calixto was killed and the colonel lost his reason then don hilario made himself all-powerful doing what he liked with his master and setting doña demetria's authority aside did he protect the interests of the estancia on the contrary 
he was one with our enemies and when they came like dogs for our cattle and horses he was behind them this he did to make friends of the reigning party when the blancos had lost everything now he wishes to marry doña demetria to make himself owner of the land don calixto is dead and who is there to bell the cat even now he acts like the only owner he buys and sells and the money is his my mistress is scarcely allowed clothes to wear she has no horse to ride on and is a prisoner in her own house he watches her like a cat watching a bird shut in a room if he suspected her of an intention to make her escape he would murder her he has sworn to her that unless she marries him he will kill her is not this sad senor she asks you to deliver her from this man her words i have forgotten but imagine that you see her before you a suppliant on her knees and that you know what the thing is she asks and see her lips move though you do not hear her words tell me how i can deliver her i said feeling very much moved at what i had heard how by carrying her off forcibly do you understand is it not in your power to return in a few days time with two or three friends to do this thing you must come disguised and armed if i am in the way i will do what i can to protect her but you would easily knock me down and stun me do you understand don hilario must not know that we are in the plot from him fear nothing for though he is brave enough to threaten a woman with death before armed men he is like a dog that hears thunder you can then take her to montevideo and conceal her there the rest will be easy don hilario will fail to find her ramona and i will take care of the colonel and when his daughter is out of his sight perhaps he will forget her then senor there will be no trouble about the property for who can resist a legal claim i do not understand you santos said i if demetria wishes me to do what you say and there is no other way to save her from don hilario's persecutions i will do it i will do anything to serve her and i have no fear of that dog hilario but when i have placed her in concealment who in montevideo where she is without a friend will take up her cause and see that she is not defrauded of her rights i can give her liberty but that will be all the property will be the same as yours when you marry her said he i had never suspected that this was coming and was amazed to hear it will you tell me santos said i that demetria sent you to say this to me does she think that only by marrying her i can deliver her from this robber and save her property there is of course no other way said he if it could be done by other means would she not have spoken last night and explained everything to you consider senor all this large property would be yours if you do not like this department then she will sell everything for you to buy an estancia elsewhere or to do whatever you wish and i ask you this senor could any man marry a better woman no said i but santos i cannot marry your mistress i remember then sadly enough that i had told her next to nothing about myself seeing me so young wandering homeless about the country she had naturally taken me 
for a single man, and perhaps thinking that I had conceived an affection for her, had been driven in her despair to make this proposal. Poor Demetria! Was there to be no deliverance for her, after all? Friend, said Santos, dropping the ceremonious signor in his anxiety to serve his mistress, never speak without first considering all things there is no woman like her if you do not love her now you will love her when you know her better no good man could help feeling affection for her you saw her last evening in a green silk dress also wearing a tortoiseshell comb and gold ornaments was she not elegant senor did she not then appear to your eyes a woman suitable for a wife? You have been everywhere, and have seen many women, and perhaps in some distant place you have met one more beautiful than my mistress. But consider the life she has led. Grief has made her pale and thin, staining her face with purple under the eyes, can laughter and song come out of a heart where fear is another life would change all she would be a flower amongst women poor old simple-minded santos he had done himself great injustice his love for his mistress had inspired him with an eloquence that went to my heart and poor demetria driven by her weary desolate life and torturing fears to make in vain this unwomanly proposal to a stranger and after all it was not unwomanly for in all countries where they are not abject slaves it is permissible for women in some circumstances to propose marriage even in england it is so where society is like a huge clapham junction with human creatures moving like trucks and carriages on cast iron conventional rails which they can only leave at the risk of a destructive collision and a proposal of the kind was never more justifiable than in this case shut away from the sight of men in her dreary seclusion haunted by nameless fears her offer was to bestow her hand along with a large property on a penniless adventurer nor had she done this before she had learnt to love me and to think perhaps that the feeling was returned she had waited too till the very last moment only making her offer when she had despaired of its coming from me this explained the reception of the previous evening the ancient splendid attire which she had worn to win favour in my sight, the shy, wistful expression of her eyes, the hesitation she could not overcome. When I had recovered from the first shock of surprise, I could only feel the greatest respect and compassion for her, bitterly regretting that I had not told her all my past history, so that she might have been spared the shame and grief she would now be compelled to endure these sad thoughts passed through my mind while santos expatiated on the advantages of the proposed alliance until i stopped him say no more i said for i swear to you santos that were it possible i would gladly take demetria for a wife so greatly do i admire and esteem her but I am married. Look at this. It is my wife's portrait. And taking from my bosom the miniature which I always wore round my neck, I handed it to him. He stared at me in silent astonishment for a few moments, then took the portrait into his hand, and while he gazed admiringly at it, I pondered over what I had heard. I could not now think of leaving this poor woman who had offered herself 
with all her inheritance to me, without some attempt to rescue her from her sad position. She had given me a refuge when I was in trouble and danger, and the appeal she had just made to me, accompanied by so convincing a proof of her trust and affection, would have gone to the heart of the most cold-blooded man in existence, to make him, in spite of his nature, her devoted champion. At length Santos handed back the miniature with a sigh. Such a face as that my eyes have never seen, he remarked. There is nothing more to be said. There is a great deal more to be said, I returned. I have thought of an easy plan to help your mistress. When you have reported this conversation, tell her to remember the offer of assistance made to her last night. I said I would be a brother to her, and I shall keep my promise. You three cannot think of any better scheme to save Demetria than this one you have told me but it is after all a very poor scheme full of difficulty and danger to her my plan is a simpler and safer one tell her to come out to-night at midnight after the moon has set to meet me under the trees behind the house i shall be there waiting with a horse for her and will take her away to some safe place of concealment where Don Hilario will never find her. When she is once out of his power, it will be time enough to think of some way to turn him out of the estancia and to arrange matters. See that she does not fail to meet me, and let her take a few clothes and some money, if she has any, also her jewels, for it would not be safe to leave them in the house with Don Hilario. Santos was delighted with my scheme, which was so much more practical, though less romantic, than the one hatched by those three simple-minded conspirators. With heart full of hope, he was about to leave me, when he suddenly exclaimed, But, senor, how will you get the horse and side saddle for Doña Demetria? Leave it all to me, I said. Then we separated, he to return to his mistress, who was no doubt anxiously waiting to know the result of our conversation, I to get through the next fifteen hours in the best way I could. End of chapter 25twenty six of the purple land this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by rick vena the purple land by w h hudson chapter twenty six after leaving Santos, I rode on to a belt of wood about two miles east of the road, and passing through it, surveyed the country lying beyond. The only habitation near it was a shepherd's lonely rancho, standing on an open plain of yellow grass, over which a scattered flock of sheep and a few horses were grazing. I determined to remain in the wood till near noon, then proceed to the rancho to get breakfast, and commence my search for a horse and side-saddle in the neighborhood. After unsaddling my horse and tying him to a tree, where there were some pickings of grass and herbage about the roots, I lit a cigar and made myself comfortable on my rugs in the shade. Presently, I had some visitors, and a flock of uracas, or magpies, as they are called in the vernacular, or guira cuckoos, a graceful, loquacious bird, 
resembling a magpie, only with a longer tail and a bold red beak. These ill-mannered birds skulked about in the branches over me all the time I remained in the wood, scolding me so incessantly in their intolerably loud, angry, rattling notes, varied occasionally with shrill whistlings and groans, that I could scarcely even hear myself think. They soon succeeded in bringing all the other birds within hearing distance to the spot to take part in the demonstration. It was unreasonable of the cuckoos, to say the least of it, for it was now long past their breeding season, so that parental solicitude could not be pleaded as an excuse for their churlish behavior. The others, tanagers, finches, tyrant birds, red, white, blue, gray, yellow, and mixed, were, I must own, less troublesome, for after hopping about for a while, screaming, chirping, and twittering, they very sensibly flew away, no doubt thinking their friends, the cuckoos, were making a great deal too much fuss. My sole mammalian visitor was an armadillo that came hurrying towards me, looking curiously like a little old bent-backed gentleman in a rusty black coat, trotting briskly about on some very important business. It came to within three yards of my feet, then stopped, and seemed astonished beyond measure at my presence, staring at me with its little, bleary, blinking eyes, and looking more like the shabby old gentleman than ever. Then it trotted away through the trees, but presently returned for a second inspection, and after that it kept coming and going, till I inadvertently burst out laughing, whereupon it scuttled away in great alarm, and returned no more. I was sorry I had frightened the amusing little beggar, for I felt in that exceedingly light-hearted mood when one's merriment is ready to brim over at the slightest provocation. Yet that very morning, poor Demetria's appeal had deeply stirred my heart, and I was now embarked on a most quixotic and perhaps perilous adventure. Possibly the very fact of that adventure being before me had produced an exhilarating effect on my mind, and made it impossible for me to be sad, or even decently composed. After spending a couple of hours in the pleasant shade, the blue smoke ascending from the rancho before me gave notice of the approaching breakfast hour. So saddling my horse, I went to make my morning call. The cuckoos, hailing my departure with loud mocking shouts, and whistling calls, meant to inform all their feathered friends that they had at last succeeded in making their haunt too hot for me. At the rancho I was received by a somewhat surly-looking young man, with long, intensely black hair and moustache, and who wore, in place of a hat, a purple cotton handkerchief tied about his head. He did not seem to be over-pleased at my visit, and invited me rather ungraciously to alight if I thought proper. I followed him into the kitchen, where his little brown-skinned wife was preparing breakfast, and I fancied, after seeing her, that her prettiness was the cause of his inhospitable manner towards a stranger. She was singularly pretty with a seductive, soft brown skin, ripe, pouting lips of a rich purple red, and when she laughed, which happened very frequently, her teeth glistened like pearls. Her crisp black hair hung down, unbound and disordered, for she looked like a very careless little beauty. But when she saw me enter, she blushed, and tossed her tresses away from her shoulders, then carefully 
felt the pendants dropping from her ears to assure herself that they were safe or possibly to attract my attention to them the frequent glances her laughing dark eyes shot at me soon convinced me that she was one of those charming little wives charming that is when they are the wives of other people who are not satisfied with a husband's admiration i had timed my arrival well for the roast lamb over the coals was just assuming a deep golden brown colour and sending out a most delicious fragrance during the repast which followed i amused my auditors and myself by telling a few innocent lies and began by saying that i was on my return to rocha from montevideo the shepherd remarked suspiciously that i was not on the right road i answered that i knew it then proceeded to say that i had met with a misfortune on the previous evening which in the end had led me out of the right road i had only been married a few days i continued and at this declaration my host looked relieved while the little gypsy suddenly seemed to lose all interest in me my wife i said set her heart on having a side saddle as she is very fond of riding so having business which took me to town i there purchased one for her and was returning with it on a lead horse my wife's horse unfortunately when i stopped last evening to get some refreshment at a pulperia on the road while eating some bread and sausage a tipsy person who happened to be there imprudently began to explode some fire crackers which so terrified the horses tied at the gate that several of them broke loose and escaped my wife's horse with the side saddle on him escaped with them then mounting my own horse i started in pursuit but failed to overtake the runaway finally it joined a herd of mares and these becoming terrified fled from me leading me a chase of several leagues till i lost sight of them in the darkness if your wife resembles mine in disposition friend said he with a somewhat sorrowful smile you would have continued following that runaway animal with the side saddle to the end of the world i can say this i returned gravely without a side saddle good or bad i am not going to present myself before her i intend inquiring at every house on my way to the lomas de rocha till i can hear of one for sale what will you give for one said he becoming interested that will depend on its condition if it is as good as new i will give the amount it cost and two dollars profit besides i know of a side saddle that cost ten dollars a year ago but it has never been used it belongs to a neighbor three leagues from here and she would sell it i believe show me the house i said and i will go directly and offer twelve dollars for it you speak of doña petrona's side saddle antonio said the little wife she would sell it for what it cost perhaps for eight dollars ah pumpkin head why did you not think to make all that profit then i could have bought slippers and a thousand things you're never satisfied cleta he returned have you not got slippers to your feet she tossed up a pretty foot and displayed it cased in rather a shabby little slipper then with a laugh she kicked it off towards him there she exclaimed put it in your bosom and keep it something precious and some day when you go to montevideo and wish to appear very grand before all the town wear it on your great toe who expects reason from a woman said antonio shrugging his shoulders reason you have no more brains than a muscovy duck antonio you might have made this profit 
but you never can make money like other men, and therefore you will always be poorer than the spiders. I have said this before very often, and only hope you will not forget it, for in future I intend to speak of other things. Where would I have got the ten dollars to pay Petrona for the saddle? he retorted, losing his temper. My friend, I said, if the saddle can be had, it is only just that you should have the profit. Take ten dollars, and if you buy it for me, I will pay you two more. This proposal pleased him greatly, while Cleta, the volatile, clapped her hands with delight. While Antonio prepared to go to his neighbors after the saddle, I went out to a solitary thorn tree about fifty yards from the rancho, and spreading my poncho in the shade, lay down to sleep the siesta. Before the shepherd had been long gone, I heard a great noise in the house, like banging on doors and on copper vessels, but took no notice, supposing it to proceed from Cleta, engaged in some unusually noisy domestic operation. At length I heard a voice calling to me, Signor, Signor. Getting up, I went to the kitchen, but no person was there. Suddenly a loud knock was given on the door, communicating with the second room. Oh, my friend, cried Cleta's voice behind it, my ruffian of a husband has locked me in. Can you let me out, do you think? Why has he locked you in, I asked. The question, because he is a brute, of course. He always does it when he goes out. Is it not horrible? It only shows how fond he is of you, I returned. Are you so atrocious as to defend him? And I thought you had a heart, so handsome, too. When I saw you, I said, Ah, uh, had I married this man, what a happy life. Thank you for your good opinion, I said. I am very sorry you are locked in, because it prevents me from seeing your pretty face. Oh, you think it pretty? Then you must let me out. I have put up my hair now, and look prettier than when you saw me. You look prettier with it down, I answered. Ah, uh, down it goes again, then, she exclaimed. Yes, you are right. It does look best that way. Is it not like silk? You shall feel it when you liberate me. That I cannot do, Cleta mine. Your Antonio has taken away the key. Oh, cruel man, he left me no water, and I am perishing with thirst. What shall I do? Look, I will put my hand under the door for you to feel how hot it is. I am consumed with fever and thirst in this oven. Presently, her little brown hand came out at my feet, there being sufficient space between the floor and wood to pass it through. I stooped and took it in mine, and found it a hot, moist little hand, with a pulse beating very fast. Poor child, I said, I will pour some water in a plate and pass it to you under the door. Oh, you are bad to insult me, she cried. What, am I a cat to drink water from a plate? I could cry my eyes out. Here followed sob-like sounds. Besides, she suddenly resumed, It is fresh air, not water I require. I am suffocated. I cannot breathe. Oh, dear friend, save me from fainting. Force back the door till the bolt slips out. No, no, Cleta, it cannot be done. What, with your strength? I could almost do it myself with my poor little hands. Open, open, open before I faint. She had evidently sunk down on the floor, sobbing, after making that practical suggestion and casting about for burglarious implements to aid me. I found the spit in a wedge-shaped piece of hard wood. These I inserted just above and below the lock, and, forcing back the door on its frame, I soon had the satisfaction of seeing the bolt slip from the catch. Out sprang Cleta, 
flushed, tearful, her hair all in disorder, but laughing gleefully at having regained her liberty. Oh, dear friend, I thought you were going to leave me, she cried. How agitated I am. Feel how my heart beats. Never mind. I can now pay that wretch out. Is not revenge sweet, sweet, sweet? Now, Cleda, I said, take three mouthfuls of fresh air and a drink of water, then let me lock you in again. She laughed mockingly and shook her hair like a wild young coat. Ah, you are not serious. Do you not think I know? She cried. Your eyes tell me everything. Besides, you could not shut me up again if you tried. Here she made a sudden dash at the door, but I caught her and held her a close prisoner. Let me go, monster. Oh, no, not monster. Dear, sweet friend, beautiful as the moon, sun, stars. I am dying for fresh air. I will come back to the oven before he returns. If he caught me out... What blows? Come, let us sit under the tree together. That would be disobeying your husband, I said, trying to look stern. Never mind, I will confess it all to the priest some day. Then it would be as if it had never happened. Such a husband, poof! If you are not a married man, are you married? What a pity! Say again, am I pretty? Say first, Cleda. Have you a horse a woman can ride on? And if you have one, will you sell it to me? Oh, yes, the best horse in the Banda Oriental. They say it is worth six dollars. Will you buy it for six dollars? No, I shall not sell it. I shall not tell you that I have a horse till you answer me. Am I pretty, sir stranger? Tell me first about the horse. Then ask me what you like. Nothing more will I tell you, not a word, yes, everything. Listen, when Antonio comes back, ask him to sell you a horse for your wife to ride. He will try to sell you one of his own, a demon full of faults like his master, false-footed, lame in the shoulder, a roarer, old as the south wind, a black piebald, remember. Offer to buy a roan with a cream nose. That is my horse. Offer him six dollars. Now say, am I pretty? Oh, beautiful, Cleta. Your eyes are stars. Your mouth is a rosebud. Sweeter than honey a thousand times. Now you talk like a wise man, she laughed. Then, holding my hand, she led me to the tree and sat down by my side on the poncho. And how old are you, little one? I asked. Fourteen. Is that very old? Ah, fool, to tell my age truly. No woman does that. Why did I not say thirteen? And I have been married six months, such a long time. I am sure I have green, blue, yellow, gray hairs coming out all over my head by this time. And what about my hair, sir? You never spoke of that. Did I not let it down for you? Is it not soft and beautiful? Tell me, sir, what about my hair? In truth, it is soft and beautiful, Cleta, and covers you like a dark cloud. Does it not? Look, I will cover my face with it. Now I am hidden like the moon in a cloud. And now, look, out comes the moon again. I have a great respect for the moon say holy friar am i like the moon say little sweet lips why do you call me holy friar say first holy friar am i like the moon no cleta you are not like the moon though you are both married women you are married to antonia poor me and the moon is married to the sun happy moon to be so far from him the moon is a quiet wife but you chatter like a paroquet and am i not able to be quiet also monk look i will be quiet as the moon not a word not a breath 
Then she threw herself back on the poncho, feigning sleep, her arms above her head, her hair scattered everywhere, only a tress or two half shading her flushed face and round heaving bosom that would not be quiet. There was just a little mocking smile on her lips, just a little gleam of laughing eyes under her drooping lashes, for she could not help watching my face for admiration. In such an attitude, the tempting little witch might have made the tepid blood of an ascetic boil. Two or three hours thus flew swiftly by, while I listened to her lively prattle, which, like the lark singing, had scarcely a pause in it, her attempt at being still and moonlight having ended in a perfect fiasco. At length, pouting her pretty lips and complaining of her hard lot, she said it was time to go back to her prison, but all the time I was engaged in forcing back the bolt into its place, she chattered without ceasing. I do, son, husband of the moon, she said. I do, sweet, sweet friend, buyer of side saddles. They were all lies you told, I know, I know. You want a horse and side saddle to carry off some girl tonight. Happy she. Now I must sit in the dark alone, alone, alone till Antonio the atrocious comes to liberate me with his iron key. Ah, fool. Before I had been long back under my tree, Antonio appeared, bringing the side saddle in triumph on his horse before him. After going in to release his wife, he came out and invited me to take Mate. I then mentioned my wish to buy a good horse. He was only too willing to sell, and in a few minutes his horses were driven up for inspection. The black piebald was first offered, a very handsome, quiet-looking animal, apparently quite sound. The cream nose, I noticed, was a bony, long-bodied brute with sleepy eyes and a ewe neck. Could it be that the little double-dealing witch had intended to deceive me? But in a moment I dismissed such a suspicion with the scorn it merited. Let a woman be as false as she can, and able to fool her husband to the top of her bent. She is, compared with the man who wishes to sell you a horse, openness and truth itself. I examined the piebald critically walking and trotting him round, looked into his mouth, then at hoofs and fetlocks, beloved of wind-galls, gazed with fixed attention into his eyes, and dealt him a sudden, brisk blow on the shoulder. "'No weak spot will you find, senor,' said Antonio the Mendacious, who was certainly the greatest of the three sinners met together in that place. He is my best horse, only four years old, gentle as a lamb, sound as a bell, sure-footed, senor, like no other horse, and with such an easy pace you can ride him at a gallop with a tumbler of water in your hand and not spill a drop. I will give him away to you for ten dollars, because you have been generous about the side saddle and I am anxious to serve you well. Thank you, my friend, I said. Your piebald is fifteen years old, lame in the shoulders, broken in his wind, and has more vices than any seven horses in the Banda Oriental. I would not allow my wife to ride such a dangerous brute, for as I told you, I have not been long married. Antonio framed his face, to express astonishment and virtue indignant. Then, with the point of his knife, he scratched the figure of a cross on the ground, and was about to swear solemnly on it that I was egregiously mistaken, that his beast was a kind of equine angel, or a pegasus at least, when I interfered to stop him. Tell as many lies as you like, I said, 
and I will listen to them with the greatest interest, but do not swear on the figure of the cross to what is false, for then the four or five or six dollars profit you have made on the side saddle will scarcely be sufficient to buy you absolution for such a sin. He shrugged his shoulders and restored the sacrilegious knife to its sheath. There are my horses, he said in an injured tone. They are a kind of animal you seem to know a great deal about. Select one and deceive yourself. I have endeavored to serve you, but there are some people who do not know a friend when they see one. I then minutely examined all the other horses, and finally finished the farce by leading out the roan cream nose, and was pleased to notice the crestfallen expression of my good shepherd. Your horses do not suit me, I said, so I cannot buy one. I will, however, purchase this old cow, for it is the only animal here I could trust my wife on. You can have seven dollars for it, not one copper more, for like the Emperor of China, I speak once only. He plucked off his purple headgear and scratched his raven head, then led me back to the kitchen to consult his wife. For Signor, he said, you have by some fatality selected her horse when cleta heard that seven dollars had been offered for the roan she laughed with joy oh antonio he is only worth six dollars yes senor you shall have him and pay the seven dollars to me not to my husband who will say now that i cannot make money and now antonio i have no horse to ride on you can give me the bay with white forefeet. Do not imagine such a thing, exclaimed her husband. After taking Mate, I left them to settle their affairs, not doubting which would come out best from a trial of skill. When I arrived in sight of Peralta's trees, I unsaddled and picketed my horses, then stretched myself out on my rugs, after the excitements and pleasures of that day, which had robbed me of my siesta, I quickly fell into a very sound sleep. End of chapter 26